If you want to reinvent the wheel, do it later. Do it later. Follow the system. Get the success. And then once you have the success, if you still want to reinvent things, go ahead and do it then. I like to call myself a professional storyteller. What I do is I help my clients figure out what it is that they're trying to say and say it in a way that's going to give them new friends. Never, ever, ever give up on yourself. Always rely on one person, that's you. And never, ever quit because the minute you quit is the minute you fail. Storytelling, like Helen said, that's that. there's so much power in that. And, and it has the power to change people's minds, has power to change culture, has the power to change the world. I still believe that's the route, especially that we're in this digital age now of social media and, and connected TV and everything like that, it's so easy to get a story out there and have it be heard. I'm Richard Gerhardt. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhardt. <laughs> Welcome to Passage to Profit, the show that's all about entrepreneurs, small businesses, and the intellectual property that helps them flourish. As well as tongue twisters. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, does success leave clues? Well, our guest this evening is Robert Raymond Riopal, and he knows that it does and he will show you how to find clues to improve your success. Our executive spotlight this evening is Helen Myers from Three Dots PR, interviewed by Emmy Award winning uh, uh, Carrie Barrett of Carrie Barrett Consulting. And then we have two presenters. Our first presenter is Michael Rose from Academy Service Group. Michael is a client of Gearheart Law and we are so impressed by him. We asked him to be on the show uh, I'll let you, I'll let him tell you what we do, but I tell you, this guy is super impressive. And then we have Jason Ellinger with Beard and Bowler, and you have to see him on our YouTube channel and social media. He lives his brand. I love Jason. <laughs> and uh, he wants to change selfish culture and bring back chivalry and honor with this business. So stay tuned. All of that sounds great. But before we get to our distinguished guests, let's go to IP in the news. So What's on the table for IP in the news today? Well, Google's in trouble in France. <laughs> Once again. So regular listeners of our show will know that Google was fined by the European Commission uh, in, and forced to pay royalties for content uh, to publishers uh, that, publish, that they use on their websites there. So the publishers weren't making any money. Google was making all the money. The European Commission didn't think that was fair. And so they forced the publishers to uh, negotiate contracts with Google. And so what's the latest in that story? Well, France is now suing Google or uh, threatening to sue Google because they're not following through well yeah. enough, apparently. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, they leveled the fine against, the, uh, against uh, Google because they weren't negotiating with the publishers in good faith. So wow. I'm, that's, uh, that's really interesting because I'm sure uh, Google is uh, seeing this as a precedent and the types of contracts they form with the publishers are going to be sort of a template that is used every place else where Google is forced to pay the publishers. And so they're probably not trying to give too much and the publishers are complaining that they're not giving enough. And so the European Commission stepped in in order to make sure that they did give enough. So um, very interesting uh, situation and uh, we'll just see what happens there. Hopefully the publishers will get some money from Google. Right, Right. so time for your round table, Richard. Right, so everyone, um, it's time for Richard's round table and we're if, just wondering if you have any comments about uh, what we just talked about or uh, any questions in general about intellectual property. And we'll start with Robert. Yeah, you know, I just know it's very important to protect it. And I can see Google's side of things for sure. Because what you said, that precedence, once that precedent set, it's now going worldwide. And my favorite saying um, over the last few days has been, I love Google. Because, you know, anything I need to know, I've got to be able to Google it. And so I love that information and just having the access. So I'm going to be interesting to watch how this plays out and what the precedence that set is. And it's interesting what you just said, because... Theoretically, if, if Google has to pay publishers, then they're going to pay fewer publishers, right? And so you're going to get less, potentially less news, right? So it could have a chilling effect. So it works both ways, right? Yeah. So let's go to Carrie next. Carrie, what are your thoughts? Hi, 
Yes, I muted myself. I do this for a living and yet I still manage. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how many hours I've lost telling people they're muted. Nevertheless, here I am. I am a big fan of Google. Uh, I mean, like like Robert said, I believe it was Robert. It's part of my daily existence. That said, I can see why there's there's room perhaps for some competition. That doesn't mean Google has to give away all of their secrets. I, I don't know. I'm not a expert obviously in IP law, I can see, I think both sides of the case and wanting to give consumers perhaps a little more opportunity for different choices. But at the end of the day, I think probably 10 or 20 years from now, we might just be thinking it, but we'll still be Googling things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who's next? Um, yeah, so um, Helen, what do you think? I definitely echo what Robert and Carrie said. Um, I think we also need to remember that, you know, social media and websites in general, it's still a very new medium, right? They haven't been around as much as print and even television. So I think the rules are going to constantly be changing as they adapt and learn and grow, just like our there was no such thing as the FCC, right, 50 years ago, but now there is to help monitor and make sure broadcast and everything that is being said is said correctly and that there's no profanity or anything like that. So I, I foresee that um, everything on the web is going to eventually get to that place, but we still have to remember it's still a very young medium and they're still growing. Very good point. Absolutely. Um, Michael, what are your thoughts? I think that uh, intellectual property rights have the right to be protected, no matter who's producing them. Um, I think that there's Google, Bing. I think that a uh, publisher um, needs to have rights protected. That's why they have certain laws out there, like uh, like patent laws and different things like this. I know Google is, is definitely a friend, right? We love Google. I had seen a clip the other day in reference to a uh, a person walking into a uh, city MD facility and saying that I think I have a terminal disease because I, you know, I Googled it. And the lady, when she heard Googled it, she said, it must be true. So, <laughs> so, I mean, it was like, you know, they were laughing about it being on the web first. But then when she heard Googled it, you know, Google is, a, is an amazing product. It's, a, it's an amazing company. It's an amazing source for information. Um, and it does, I think, sometimes, I sometimes think it's, it breaches intellectual property rights because it'll find a document maybe that I published and it'll find my document. And anybody has access to that when I don't want anybody to have access to that. So um, that's that's pretty much how I feel about it. I mean, yeah, it well, that's an excellent uh, comment. Kenya? I agree with Mike. You know, uh, it sounds like a really bad record deal uh, coming from the music and the entertainment industry. I'm very pro creator and, and being able to protect your work and being paid for your work. Right. So you know, it's Google's cool. It's a great, you know, tool for us to have. But at the same time, you know, I don't think anyone should have the opportunity to unlawfully leverage someone else's work and that person not get compensated for it. Okay. Absolutely. So Jason. Jason. I mean, just think about it, Richard. If let's say you were to have, let's say, a, a special way of creating a patent and it was the best way of everybody. Which we how do, would you by feel the way. If somebody stole your idea and your concept. It just wouldn't be fair. Right. No. And um, so there's there's got to be a balance somewhere. I mean, the creators deserve to get paid for sure. Agreed. Um, but by the same token, you don't want to make it so expensive because that cost is going to get passed on to us. Right. Where Google is free now, they're going to start charging us a monthly fee or something to cover the cost that they have to pay uh, the creator producers. So, Jason, what do you think? Uh, I'm a little bit with everybody. Uh, I'm a little biased because my son's, my 18 month old son's sixth word was Google. Um, just out of nowhere. <laughs> I was on the phone asking somebody for a Google review and he looked at me, he's like, Google. And so, <laughs> it's the cutest thing ever. Um, but yeah, I mean, in my industry uh, for, for commercial filmmaking, if you have a video or, or people that are in your video, all of them need release forms. If you have music that you're using in a video, doesn't matter if it's a startup artist or a well-established artist, like if you don't have express written consent for that um, and compensate them properly, you can get sued and everybody is liable. So um, I think as these 
tech companies grow and it's kind of the wild, wild west, everyone should be regulated. Uh, I hate to be too regulated so that it's, it stifles growth, but at the same time, there, there are the little guys that, um, you know, maybe they didn't even have the intention of hurting, but um, they just have to be thought about. And sometimes laws don't come into existence until, you know, there's an actual problem. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard that Google, for example, translates books and without compensating the authors at all and just puts them on the internet and makes that available. And they use books to help develop their speech algorithms. And again, the people who wrote the books don't get any compensation for it. So uh, it's, it, it is an interesting problem, but I agree with Helen, you know, this is still the wild west and they got to work things out, but it's interesting direction that the internet is, is, is going into. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your comments. We have to take a commercial break, but we'll be right back after this message. Welcome back everybody to Passage to Profit. Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, we'd like to introduce our guest this evening, uh, Robert Raymond Riopel, and he's an author, podcaster, uh, app designer, and he's also the founder of A Mentors Inc. So welcome to the show, uh, Robert. Uh, and your, your book is about uh, clues to success. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what that means and how that works. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, as you said, I'm an international best-selling author and a trainer. And for the last 18 plus years, I've been blessed to not only travel around the world and train from 100 to 6,000 students at a time for three to five days at a time, but I've been able to share the stage with some of the greatest thought leaders in the world. And I was watching what clues were they dropping? What similarities did they have to other people? And because I love, I love watching people. You can learn so much just by watching what they do. And so from that, I was able to start gleaming some great success clues. And I decided to put them into my book and break it down to six very simple steps that if someone wanted to create a life to take themselves to a new level, that they can put these in. And I kept it simple for reason because I can make it really tough and sound you know, extremely smart, which I'm not gonna say I'm smart because I'm not, I'm just an everyday person but I knew if it, I made it too tough, people wouldn't do it. So I keep it very easy, which the problem of that is some people then go, it can't be that simple. And then some people don't do it. So throughout the book, I just walk people through on how to really dream big again. And then from their dreams, how to actually bring them into reality. So what are I'm, the steps really, do? I'm really anxious to hear these clues. So you have to share them with us. Well, one, one clue I do, and on the front of my book, I have my hands up like this because on the stage, I'll go give us a clue and I'll get everybody to do that. And one is people, one of the reasons they struggle is they try to reinvent something. They see a system in place and they look at it and they go, I've got to do it my way. And so they reinvent it. And then they wonder why they struggle. So I tell them, I said, if you, and the clue is, if you want to reinvent the wheel, do it later. Do it later, follow the system, get the success. And then once you have the success, if you still wanna reinvent things, go ahead and do it then, because at least now you have the success first and now you can make some adjustments to it. So that's an example of one of the clues. Well, that's really interesting. Not so long ago, we had uh, Dave Knoll, who is a TV show creator. He created the show Chopped, for example. And one of his, one of his mantras is think inside the box. He says, you know, successful TV programs have, are just really combinations of previously successful uh, TV programs, right? And so uh, to be successful in that industry, he felt that, you know, you needed to take uh, American Idol and, and combine it with, you know, you know, some car show, you know, uh, or something, and then now you have people voting on cars, right? So you take elements from previously successful, well, Top Gear is what I was thinking of, but you take pre successful uh, elements of previous shows and you put them together. And so the public is sort of already sort of acclimated to the, uh, the idea of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that the programs. Yeah, and it's proven already. And that's the thing, no matter what you wanna do, chances are someone's done it before. So find out how they did it, find out the mistakes they made so you can avoid those, which will allow you to actually get that success even quicker. And that's the big um, key. And then another clue I have is 
something I learned the first time I went to India, choose to be happy. And that is so important, especially during this time of what's going on in our world is, is you have a choice from moment to moment. You can look at things and go, oh, why is this happening and get upset about it? Or you can say, you know what, it's happening, but I choose to have a happy life within that. And, you know, I learned that from an amazing young lady who was in an arranged marriage. And, and I was curious, I'm like, how do you make that happen? You're, you haven't even met your husband yet until the engagement party. And she said, my mom told me, choose to be happy so that no matter what goes on, at least you still have a happy life. And I love that concept. So are you using that philosophy with me? <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think choosing to be, you can choose what you think about. And I think thinking about everything you have instead of everything you don't have is great. And how far you've come instead of how far you have to go. But to go back to the first point a little bit, I do want to say when we started Passage to Profit, Richard had done some radio early on in his career in college, and I had never done any of it. We Which had, is better than I am. So No, I, but we had, had no idea what to do. And thank God Kenya was there because Kenya came up with the format. And it, this is, was something kind of new when we started doing it. Um, and law firms weren't doing podcasts typically back then. I mean, this is a radio show and a podcast, but Kenya had all the bones, right? And all yeah. the structure in place and like everything. Like we were like, oh, we want to do a call-in show. She's like, no, I don't think you're ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think that you're really right. Like if you try to invent something from the ground up, the whole shebang, it's it's overpowering. It's It's overwhelming. You just it's much tougher. Well, the, the payoff, if you make it, can be large, but you're taking a bigger risk because it is new people and it may take lo longer to get acceptance from it. So you're, you know, I mean, the idea of personal computing was revolutionary. Right. But, and, and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs turned out to be right. But if they had just invented a better calculator, their odds of success might have been a little bit better, right? So well, it took a lot of money, to and get it took a lot of money to where we are today. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and Richard, to go to a point you had made, though, think of everything that's out there today. Nothing's actually original. Nothing's original. People have looked at what's happened and they've improved on it, or they've taken it and they've enhanced it, or they've you know made an adjustment. So they've combined, like you said let's combine this TV show and this TV show to put this one out. And that's why it's a success. And so that's the key. And this is why having coaches, why having mentors in your life, people to model are so important. Being able to sit there, like when I wanted to be a trainer, I found one of the top trainers in the world and I was willing to do whatever. I shined his shoes, I pressed his shirts to be able to mentor from him and get that information. And that took me from not being on stage and ever training to all of a sudden being in front of thousands of people around the world. So having mentorship and, and coaches is critical because no idea is new. Right. Right. And that reminds me, I went to this presentation and then we have to give Kenya a chance to say something, but I went to this presentation where this young man was saying, well, Google only shows you the products it wants to show you, you know, and I'm thinking, well, but all the department stores had buyers like for hundreds of years or however, and you only got to see what they went and bought, right? So that's not new. It's just a different tool that they're using, right? Um, so Kenya, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for saying all those kind, kind things. You know, teamwork oh. makes the dream work. So we've kind of evolved in this whole radio thing together, um, which I'm very thankful for. And what I was going to say to Robert is, I was reading a little bit in your bio about your training implementation and there's a term called, it's like the cellular shift. So can you talk a little bit about the cellular shift and what that means? Yeah, so when I do trainings, I use what's called accelerated learning. And with accelerated learning, it's not just me talking. When I'm on stage for up to 12 hours a day in front of an audience, I, I get them so involved that they're not just thinking differently or making changes in understanding, but we do a cellular change right there on the spot so that when they leave a training, you know, unfortunately in North America, and I only know the statistic for North America, unfortunately only 3% of people will ever use the information they've been taught. And that's because they get it intellectually, they hear it, they listen to it, they ingrain it in their head. But by ingraining it into the cells of their body is when they leave, they're now more apt to take action. 
because they feel it. And it's not just, oh, I think this is good and I, I can do something with it. They now have it in the cells of the body. And as an example of that, I'm a breakthrough artist specialist. So one of the trains I do, I actually put thousands of people across 36 foot firewalks where the coals are 1200 to 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and when they're going across, again, you see the doubt, can I do it? Oh my goodness, I don't know. But then they take that first step and all of a sudden you see the doubt going to, oh my goodness, I'm doing it. By the time they hit the end, it's like, I did it. And then we anchor it in as if I could do that, what else could I do? And so all of a sudden you can take someone from disbelief to belief within seconds. So that's where the cellular shift comes in. Wow, that's, uh, that's impressive. Um, does anybody ever burn their feet? I mean, does it, does yeah. it always work? No, it, it, look, it's definitely mind over matter. I taught my brother-in-law how to be a firewalker and he now owns the Guinness Book of World Records for a firewalk for over 500 feet. The second time he ever went to re-break the record, he was in his ego, he was in his head, he wasn't present, third degree burns to both of his feet. Wow. Wow. Huh. So, well, I do want to say one thing. The coaching is really important. And I like Kenya has been our coach. Like her name is Coach Kenya, but she has been our radio coach and really helped us a lot. And I I do feel like everybody needs a coach at some point in their lives. And um I think that what you're doing is a little bit different because it says you're helping people tap into like their inner greatness. And it takes a special coach to do that. So what are some of your other techniques? Well, it, it, first, helping people get permission, giving themselves permission to actually go for what they truly are passionate about. You know, we've been conditioned from young that, um, you know, in the beginning, we had big dreams. Anything was possible. I could be a lawyer one day, a doctor the next day, an astronaut the next day. But then as we grow up, society starts telling us what is realistic and what's not. Uh, you don't have the right education. You weren't born into the right family. So our dreams get smaller and smaller and smaller. So by giving people the permission to own their greatness with confidence, not arrogance. And there's a big difference there. And being able, and like I love, as we said, you know, with Jason and his, his brand, his bowler and his beard, and I can see equipment behind him, I can tell he's living his passion. Like that, it just resonates from him. And I love his message. So it's getting people to have the confidence to be able to do that. And the reason I teach it is because that's where I started. So full of self-doubt, you know, that I'm born into a poor family, wrong side of the tracks. There's no way you can be successful. And yet it was because of the courage of having an amazing wife that won't let me play smaller than I am, that I'm getting to do what I do today, living my passion. So I now do that with people because I love to just, when that light comes on in their eyes, maybe sometimes for the first time in years, it's amazing. And so I'm living my passion by pulling passion out of others. So that's great. I mean, and, and so is that how you motivate people? I mean, what are some of the things that people who work from with you uh, come away with? Uh, and you, you talk about being a motivational speaker. How do you, how do, how, how, do, how are they motivated and what do you do to motivate them? Well, actually, I cringe at that word motivational speaker because motivation only lasts for an hour or a week. Um, and it goes back to the cellular. I, I look at it as a life transforming trainer. So we go through the three elements of change. First element is awareness. You can't change something if you're not even aware. So look at what's happening with Google. It's now being brought to awareness that there has to be changes in the regulations, right? So there's the awareness. Then the second step is understanding. Why do you have that belief? Why are you feeling the way you do, good, bad, or otherwise? So then the third step is where it comes to that cellular change. Being able to, once you have awareness and understanding why you believe what you believe, now if it's a belief that doesn't work for you, now we can tap into the change of it and we can actually do the, the shifts right there. And so when I work with people, it's in different areas. If I'm working in finances, as an example, I, one of the main trainings I do around the world is helping people understand why they're broke, why they're in debt, and helping them to learn how their spending habits are. Are they managing money? And then taking ownership. Take, look, when I was $150,000 in debt, my wife and I were stressed out, and we started taking ownership that we created the debt. We don't have anybody else to blame, because we used to go, well, they lost my investment. 
No, but we gave them the money to invest. So taking that ownership was a huge thing. And then from the ownership, then again, here's some steps. If you want to be financially free, here's what you need to do. And because I lived it, I went from $150,000 in debt to actually being retired financially free nine months later after learning it. I went, that worked. And then that's what tapped in my passion of wanting to help others do it. Because if I could help even one person do what my wife and I did, it would make it all worthwhile. So I don't know if that answers your question, but we go in and just, it's each person's individual, but it starts with the awareness. I was going to ask you, you do a lot of group functions. Do you also work with people one-on-one? -on -one? I absolutely do. My biggest passion is developing trainers. I've developed trainers around the world and it's finding out what is it, what's their message and how can they be more authentic on the stage, more connected. So that's my big passion right there. So I do one-on-one -on -one mentoring in that way. That's, that's really great. So Kenya, do you have another question? I do. What do you, what would you say has been your most prolific transformation based on the people that you've worked with? Oh, wow. Goodness. For me personally is getting out of my own way and just living what I'm teaching. You know, there, I love the saying, and it's so true that which we need to learn the most we teach. The reason I teach what I do is because it's a reminder um, of what I'm looking for in my life and the journey I'm on. Because the moment I quit learning, I'm done. So even though I train on stages around the world, I'm still in every audience I can be. I want to be a student. I'm hungry to learn. And I used to be one of the most closed-minded people you ever met because I was taught to be in that box. Don't question the box. Don't think outside the box. And even if you hate, and especially with work, even if you don't like what you're doing, if it's secure and supports your family, you do it no matter what. And I look back now and go, how many people are in that box? And if I can teach them to tap into their passion and make money doing what they love, oh, how much better is it than that? That's right. That's right. So how do you, I mean, how, what do you tell people when they face setbacks? How do you, uh, what kind of advice do you give them? Well, I, I'm a big believer there's no such thing as a failure. It's feedback. Some of our greatest lessons come from what did not work in our life. And so I, I actually, it's one of my mantras, I want to fail faster. Because the faster I can fail, then the more lessons I actually get, and I can make adjustments. And so um, I encourage people to ask three questions, whether when there's something they do themselves, or they're working with a team. What worked in the thing we just did? and make a list. No emotion about it, just this work, this work, this work. What didn't work, make a list. And then what can we do different? And by making that adjustment, then you get back in, you do it again. And, and look, you two doing your podcast and doing your radio show, where you are today is probably a lot different from where you started when <laughs> Coach Kenya got you going. Because you've done it again and again. It's been and downhill ever since. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to say anything, Richard, but you know, <laughs> there's that awareness, right? No, now. I know we have to agree with you. We, <laughs> we, we think it's been an uphill journey for sure. So <laughs> anyway, Robert, it's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Uh, why don't you tell our audience where they can find you and where they can read your book. Yeah, absolutely. As a, because you were so gracious to have me on your show, if they go to robertrealpel.com, just my name, R-O-B-E-R-T-R-I-O-P-E-L, they can actually get the digital copy of my book, Success Left a Clue, as our gift to them. But it does come with a caveat. It does come with a caveat. See, it's not a book to read and then put on the shelf and make shelf help. That's not going to do anybody any good. I wrote it as a workbook because the third step is take action. So I have action steps all the way through and I'll actually say in a chapter, did you do the last step? If not, stop reading right now, go back and do that step before you re keep reading. So they'll be able to get the full digital copy. Well, that's a delightful surprise. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'm sure our audience will appreciate that. So my, my, you, my pleasure. You are listening to Passage to Profit uh, with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, our special, special guest, Robert Raymond Riappel, and we'll be back right after this message. Welcome back, everybody. This is Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, and we have our special guest this evening, Helen Myers, going to be interviewed by Carrie Barrett. And Carrie, why don't you 
take it away. Uh, I'm excited to talk to Helen. Helen and I have known one another for a couple of years now. Helen, before we jump into the interview, you want to just introduce yourself to the audience and let them know what you do? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. I'm Helen Myers. I am the founder of Three Dots PR, and I like to call myself a professional storyteller. What I do is I help my clients figure out what it is that they're trying to say and say it in a way that's going to give them new friends. Um, and what I mean by that is I get them placed in the media. So anytime that you're watching the Today Show or picked up a local copy of USA Today or went online to your favorite website and you're seeing a doctor or an expert quoted, uh, chances are there's a publicist like myself that got them there. Um, and that's what I do. I just help uh, build the platform and the stepping stones for my clients to be appreciated and for them to share their knowledge and wisdom with a larger audience that they maybe not have been able to do so. Right. And, and so I want to ask you a couple of questions. First about entrepreneur life and then more about how businesses can use PR, some of the mis perceptions or conceptions, I guess, about what PR is and what it does, and maybe even how quickly it works. So my first question for you, we'll go back to the entrepreneur stuff. Tell us about a, a day in the life of Helen Myers of Three Dots PR. What is your entrepreneur life look like? So I have been an entrepreneur since 2015. So what is that? Six years now? I'm good with words, not math. Um, <laughs> And the difference is as an entrepreneur, you are everything, right? You are the CEO, the face of the company. You're the talent. You're also the intern um, making files and copies and doing work that maybe you never had to do before. Um, but being an entrepreneur, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that the highs are high and the lows are lows. There's a lot of work in, in the middle. And I think a lot of times people only see the success, but what they don't realize is everything that you've been doing and everything that you've been working so hard to get to that visibility, right? So I think um, to anyone who's about to start the entrepreneur journey, I say jump in both feet, just jump right in. Don't worry about the temperature of the pool. You'll be fine. You'll warm up in a couple of minutes, but we're all floating, right? We're all just trying to survive and figure out what the next step is. But I think being an entrepreneur is great. You, you are in charge of your own destiny, right? Yeah. And you have a say in your success. And ultimately, if you go into entrepreneurship with the right mindset in the sense that you want to help others or you want to share your skill set and help someone else through that, I think you are only destined for success. Yeah. And much like some of the people you get placed on the media as an entrepreneur, there is no such thing as overnight success. There's a whole bunch of work that's gone on behind the scenes, probably a little bit of blood, sweat and tears as well that comes into making, you know, your dream or whatever it is come to fruition. So let me ask you, since you've been doing this certainly longer than I have, what are those sort of top three lessons or top three tips you would have for somebody, aside from jumping in with both feet and not checking the temperature of the water, what are those other three tips for somebody who is beginning that, that journey, that entrepreneurial trip? The first tip you need to be aware of is procrastination. I follow this wonderful motivational speaker. Her name is Mel Robbins and her tip just stuck with me. Um, what does it mean when you don't want to move forward with a job or a task and your, your, your pile of work is just building? The reason why it's your body's way of telling you, you are under stress and it's your body's way of telling you, I need a stress relief. So the best way that I've learned to kind of break through that habit, we're all guilty of not wanting to write that article or not wanting to make those cold calls or whatever it is. And instead like go on YouTube and watch like an hour of cat videos because they're hilarious. Um, just do five minutes of work. That's it. And before you realize that once you get over that fear of stress and anxiety, before you know that five minutes quickly turns into an hour, two hours, and then you accomplish what you need to do. The second tip is be realistic with your own expectations, as well as the ones that you set for your clients. I am all for overachieving, but if you overpromise and under deliver, ultimately it's your reputation. Um, and 
I always say, be realistic. What is it that you can really do? And then if you over deliver, even better. And the last one is celebrate the wins. I have actually had this little bad boy with me for over 10 years. My husband got this for me when I got my first PR job um, right out of college. And we were dating at the time. And it's just a little bell. There's nothing special about it, but it's just a reminder to celebrate the wins, even the small ones. Plus, it makes a really fun sound. And I really like hearing it. <laughs> I love it. And that's how you call for drinks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let exactly. me move on from, from the entrepreneurial um, aspect of this and talk a little bit about what PR is. I guess the importance of it and then some of the misconceptions that people have about what PR does and how quickly it can do it. Absolutely. So PR is essentially, it's just storytelling, right? There's two types of PR. There's proactive where you create the story. You come up with what is newsworthy? What is exciting? What is new? Do we have a new product? Do we have a new location? Is something updated? What do we have? That is a proactive outreach. And then we have reactive where we follow a story. Um, is there something happening that we can hook ourselves onto? Is there a recent study? When I was working with a dentist, there was a JAMA study that came out that talked about the ineffectiveness of flossing. Um, so we create, I know it's, it's absolutely insane. So we quickly created, that was our way of hooking onto a story, right? So we quickly created um, a statement that said, the study is absolutely accurate. You only need to floss the teeth you want to keep. <laughs> and tiny little quote got us so much amazing coverage and so much attention and i love reactive outreach because those stories are going to be written on their own so why not hook onto them and be part of the conversation just like we had earlier this morning about a news story that was happening with google and we all got to you know put our say into it and, and express our thoughts about it some of the misconceptions about pr is because it's so intangible, a lot of people feel that there's no way to measure the success. And I call baloney on that. There's so many different ways. You just need to work with your publicist, your agency, figure out what your benchmarks are, monitor your website traffic. Um, people aren't just magically discovering you because they're searching Google or there was a reason why something brought them to your website. Be aware of that. What's happening? Obviously, the, mo the most obvious one is if you have something on your site that says, how did you find me? And somebody wrote, I read about you in this magazine or I saw you on Fox News or whatever the case may be. That's the most obvious way. Um, when I had a client appear on the Today Show, all of a sudden she got 1200 new followers on her Facebook page. And those followers didn't just magically appear from thin air. They found her on TV and from there they went on her website. They felt that they loved what she had to offer and say. And then they made that conscious decision of following her on her social page to continue. Um, a lot of times where PR, I think where people have a huge misunderstanding is the difference between PR, advertising, and marketing. Um, when I was attending Rutgers, there was this quote that stuck by me to this day. Advertising is what you pay for. Publicity is what you pray for, right? So what is PR? PR is earned. It gives you that sense of credibility. Why? It's someone else saying how wonderful and amazing and trustworthy you are versus in advertising marketing, it's paid. So that includes a lot of skepticism, right? It's you sharing your story. So there's a little bit of bias involved versus with PR, it's a journalist. It's somebody else. It's a two amazing hosts on a podcast sharing your story. So that ultimately builds your own brand and your own trust. I have one more question for you before we wrap up. And that question is, what is the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make when they are pursuing or perhaps have even secured a media or a PR opportunity? Is it not having a website that can handle the traffic or not understanding their story or what is it? It's just focusing on them. If I'm being perfectly honest with you, obviously you need to have a website. I always say PR is the last thing that you need to have. And it's definitely not good for my business, but it's smart for my clients, right? 
we can do PR if you don't have a website or if there's no way for people to come to you. Um, but once you have all of that established, you need to figure out what makes you, you, you don't need to have anything absolutely out of this world. When I was repping a cupcake shop, um, our big thing was her ingredients and her focus on choosing natural stuff. We, we did some fun stories about the right and wrong ways to eat a cupcake because to her size mattered on when she made that conscious choice on what size to bake her cupcakes. But ultimately I tell my people, what's your story? What makes you special? What makes you unique? Don't worry about others. Don't worry about what your competitors are doing. Put blinders on, focus on you. What makes you special? There's only one of you. Helen, as always, you're amazing. Thanks guys. Thank you. And you know what, Elizabeth and Richard, I use the same technique when I go to the gym. She was talking about just dive in and do five minutes of work, even if you don't want to. There are days when we are probably all feel this, you don't want to work out. And I'm like, okay, just get on the treadmill for five minutes. If you've done it for five minutes and you really are like, I cannot do this, then I give you permission to hop off and do something else. But <laughs> it's just that five minutes is all it takes. And then you're in. It's great advice. Great advice. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Helen and, and Carrie. It was an amazing interview. I learned a lot and I really enjoyed your, and, and your what, segment. What's your website? How can people find you? Absolutely. So it's three, the number dot PR dot com. Okay. Well, unfortunately we have to take a break and you're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt and our special guest this evening, Robert Raymond uh, Riopal, and we'll be back right after this. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, and now it's time for Fireside and Power Move. So Kenya, what's on the table for Power Move tonight? So for Power Move, we're gonna be talking about Brooklyn Nets guard, Spencer Dinwiddie. He is the creator of Galaxy social media app. It's an app that lets fans communicate directly with stars and sports entertainers. And the really cool thing about this is the platform allows creators to monetize content and interact with their fans at the same time, similar to what we were talking about with the whole Google situation earlier. So creators can also send video messages to fans. They can record master classes and they can set up fan clubs, subscri I'm sorry, subscriptions as revenue streams, right? So they already raised $7.5 million in funding. And some of the creators they have on the roster so far includes Dallas Cowboy running back, Ezekiel Elliott, NBA champion, Iman Schubert, Tiana Taylor, and Matt James from The Bachelor. So they've already got a really cool lineup of creators. And I'm excited to see when the app rolls out. It seems like it's going to be like Clubhouse, but on steroids. That sounds great. You know, if you want to make a lot of money, all you have to do is do something in sports, right? Because, um, you know, that's like people spend tons of money on, on their favorite stars. And uh, so it sounds like a really great idea. So. It is a really great idea. I mean, fan clubs have been around forever, right? But having this app where they can do some interaction and really target the stars they're interested in. I mean, that's a great idea. I, you know, it always blows us away how smart these people are. You see them playing a sport and you think that's their whole personality. And then they do something like this and you're like, wow, that guy's really smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, what's interesting too, is he's actually a creator and an investor on a few other apps. So he's, um, he leads NBA top shot and, um, he's a developer for Dapper labs. So outside of playing basketball, he's, you know, doing a lot of big things in the tech space. So it's kind of cool. Wow. Yeah, that's really awesome. A savvy businessman for sure. Mm -hmm. And yes. what's going on with Fireside? Yes. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, I have a startup called Fireside and it's a video directory of small businesses. And I have been working on it for over a year now. I have been gathering content all through the quarantine, I interviewed people, <laughs> Carrie's on my site, <laughs> and I have a YouTube channel and website. And now I'm taking that content and I'm refining the website. So I have a website designer who's actually building me a brand new website to fit my content instead of me using the website I was using where I tried to cram my content into something that didn't quite fit. So yeah, so yeah, that's, so that's very exciting. 
So our next presenter is Michael Rose. He's a client of Gearheart Law, so obviously a very smart man. Very <laughs> <laughs> now, but, but I'm not even going to try to describe what he has. It is so impressive. He is amazing. So please, Michael, tell us what you have. Um, well, the way I got introduced to Richard and uh, to Gearheart Law was through uh, a little device called the RHGP-1. And what it is, it's a uh, life safety device that goes into commercial range hood fire suppression systems um, throughout the United States. And um, although this year I just started selling them this year, um, I've sold close to 300,000 units. Um, estimated um, consumption could be around 45 to 50 million units a year. Uh, it's a really cheap product to make. Um, it, it doesn't melt till it hits 600 degrees. There's a website that I put together for this exact product. It's called rhgp1.com. And it shows you how the product works and, and, and how it, you know, helps save lives and helps save kitchen fires, stop kitchen fires. My experience in developing the product came from a company that I uh, took over when I was 18 years old. And I built it up from a very small company to the nation's largest privately held fire protection company in the United States, which I sold back in 2012. While I was doing that, I also started five other companies. Um, one was a national janitorial business. One was a national pest control company. One was a handyman maintenance company. One was a plumbing and electric company. And the other one was, uh, did they say pest control? I forgot. <laughs> I get confused sometimes. Each of these companies have their separate EIN numbers, separate companies, separate employees, and they have their own different client base. And all we do is we take care of uh, national retailers, property managers throughout Canada, the United States, uh, parts of Europe, Singapore, Guam, um, South America, Mexico. And it, it, it really ranges from anything from unstopping a toilet bowl to uh, putting on a new roof, doing plumbing dig ups, uh, taking care of rats, scorpions, snakes, alligators, um, cleaning up buildings. Obviously, we made a, a, a not, I can't even say a small fortune, a big fortune when COVID hit. It was the best thing since sliced bread. It was great. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, some people's pain is another people's gain. Right. So teamwork. Yay. There is no I in team. So, so it worked out pretty well, even when the riots were occurring. Um, our companies were tasked with uh, boarding up most of Fifth Avenue, um, uh, a lot of Texas. We, we did a lot of Chicago. We did a lot of California down in Florida, where we were actually boarding up many of our clients. So some of our clients are very they're household names, T-Mobile, Sprint, uh, TGI Fridays, Best Buy, these kind of guys. And as we're boarding up the stores, people are ripping down the boards and they're getting into the stores and they're taking phones and all kinds of stuff. So it was a pretty interesting situation. But uh, we like to do a lot of disaster recovery as well. So Mike, so are, are alligators really a problem that are, uh, as far as pests go? Um, yeah, actually, we've, we've gotten quite a few calls. So think about it. If you had one in your backyard, would you like it there? <laughs> you <know what>? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to call somebody. Or are to get you willing to give out your personal phone number? I just want we want to know. Because I want you to come over to our house if we have an alligator problem. Yeah, no, well, I promise you, uh, I won't, I won't myself go, but we'll take, I'll send some, one of my guys down there to take care of it. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we do a lot of stuff with alligators, snakes, um, bats, owls, all kinds of things, pigeons. I mean, you got to, you know, with the pest controls, it's, it's pretty serious. Right. So what is your most popular item that you have that people come to you with help for help with? Um, well, so fire protection and plumbing are usually the biggest issues. Um, but what it is, is what my company is able to provide for, for these major companies that other companies just can't. Like they could call a local plumber and he would be cheaper than I am. But what I do is we just, we're, we're an outsourcing agency that just retains all the data, retains all the warranty information, return, retains all the, the, the intellectual property that, that truthfully these companies need to manage so that they can keep their costs down. Wait, so, wait, wait. You're, you're more expensive than a regular plumber? <laughs> Yes. Is that even possible? I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think so. Anyway, anyway so, so you you are really a white glove company then? Um, yeah, I would say, well, it's a blue collar white glove company. Yeah, it's very blue collar. Um, you know, we're, we're down and dirty kind of technician kind of people, guys that drive trucks, guys that walk into uh, restaurants and um, clean those range hoods or, you know, take care of certain things that, that we're hired to do. But you do everything. So you keep the records so they can call you up and you can look in your records and you can see exactly what's been done and you can go help them. hundred percent. Right? Yeah. Especially when it comes down to HVAC systems, you know what I'm saying? Because they break a lot and they need service and they need maintenance every six months or every year. Like, for example, <laughs> I mean, the fire side, portable fire extinguishers, fire alarms, they need, 
they need service whether every six years or every or every month or every six months. Um, there's certain fire codes, there's certain building standards that have to be adhered to. Smaller companies just can't manage it. Um, our network is huge. I mean, our, it's really huge. And and it's just that's what we do. We keep people out of trouble. We keep the buildings running. Um, if there's disaster where there's a flood or a fire, we get those buildings up and running right away. We get that retailer back in business. Um, sometimes usually within just a few hours or 24 hours. Um, we have an incredible team. That's really amazing. I've never written any books like some of you guys. I got to tell you, I'm very impressed with the people that are on this. And I'm listening to you, Robert Raymond Ryapol. You're, you're, you're the man, brother. And Ms. Helen Myers, you're incredible. Carrie, she's just, you know, I, I'm Googling her over here while I'm listening to you guys. And Jason, you got a great thing going too, man. I mean, and Coach Kenya, you're, I'm hiring you. So I, <laughs> I, I truthfully am very impressed with each and every one of you because you, you really hit the spot on. You know, entrepreneurship isn't something that, it's something that, you know, you know, you impressed me, Helen, when you said you started just a few years ago. I mean, I think it's born into you. I think it's something I, I started my first company when I was 14 years old. I've had over probably 20 different businesses. I've sold many of them. Um, I used to sell my father's firecrackers out of my basement when I was 11. I'd steal them from my dad on the 4th of July and I'd sell them to all my friends. And, <laughs> and I would explain to them I had costs. I couldn't just give it away. And, and it was weird. My dad's like, where's all my stuff going? And where are you getting all this money at 11 years old? And then, and then landscaping when I was 14. And then, you know, so, so, you know, I've had some great successes. I truthfully have. And, and, you know, you would ask somebody earlier about, you know, what, what is an entrepreneur? You know, what, what's something you would say to an entrepreneur? I'd say, you know, it really comes down to this. Never, ever, ever give up on yourself. Always rely on one person. That's you. And never, ever quit. Because the minute you quit is the minute you fail. I don't even know what that word means. I've hit my head up against a brick wall a thousand times. And then some days I realize that, you know, I should go around that wall. And, and it works, you know. <laughs> Look at it from outside the box. Look at it from inside the box. Look at it from under the box and the top of the box. You got to look at it. And the other thing I learned about entrepreneurship is higher up. Higher up. I, I, I mean, I barely graduated high school. I was not the most intellectual person in the world. I now own patents. I have uh, seven, seven businesses, a real estate portfolio of over 25 properties, the Ferraris, the cars, all that bullshit. I got all that crap. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm looking to settle back down a little bit and help people. So what Robert was saying about teaching people and inspiring people you know, motivational speaking does it. It phases out after just a short period of time. But if you can lift those people up and you could educate them, what's that old selling, saying, Helen? Teach a man to fish, he could eat forever. If you feed a man, he could only eat for a day. So I teach my people how to get, get involved, how to, how to lift them up and, and teach them how to do things right. And you know what? I, I got a room full of people outside of here that's just, they're incredible. And I got to tell you, my success is all based upon them. It's not based upon me. It's based upon what I could teach them. And it's based upon some of the clients and the things that we bring to the table. But what it really comes down to is the people that I hire. When if I hire wrong, it's my bad. If I hire right, it's somebody else's best benefit. And, 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 and that's the truth. And, and I just, Richard, I, I can't say thank you enough for what you've done for me for this, for this little, little goober thing. You know what I'm saying? This was great, man. Dealing with you and your firm was easy. Well, we appreciate that. And I, I saw your LinkedIn post when uh, you put out that you had sold like, I don't know, 100,000 or something like that. It was a milestone. I'm like, holy cow, yeah, that yeah, thing that really cool. took off. And I was really proud that we were able to protect that invention for you. Well, you know, it's think, part of that. I think too, it goes back to what Robert was saying in that you didn't uh, redo the whole fire extinguisher. You found a piece for it that it needed that was innovative and you made that one piece and, yeah. and look at what you've done with it. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Really incredible. Yeah. I mean, it, the, what happens is the commercial fire extinguishers have pipes to spray uh, chemicals onto the stove if it overheats. And so, uh, he, but they fill with grease, right? And then they become mm -hmm. non-operational. It's very hard to clear the grease out of the pipe. So he invented two little caps that go on, on, on the outlets that allow the wires to, to move through, keeps all the grease out of the pipes. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very simple, but it's a, it's a great safety improvement. Ingenious. It, it yeah. really is. Um, that's the number one reason why these systems fail. Um, you know, in my, and like I said, when I had my first fire protection company, I've had, I have another one now. Um, I've probably installed maybe 2,000 of these types of systems myself and worked on tens of thousands of them. And, and just, it, it's, it's a no brainer. It was a no brainer. It was a quick fix. It was something that I just, I didn't reinvent it. I just took something else and just modified it a little bit and I made it work. And here we are, we're off to the races. I'm a, I'm a patent holder and I'm an inventor and I get to hang out on the Elizabeth and, and Richard Gearhart show. Yeah. 
<laughs> and we love having you we here. Where would I be without you today? <laughs> you know, well, so uh, love- I got, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, thank you. Well, we'd love to talk forever, but unfortunately, we. This is really fun. <laughs> you can keep well, it coming. Yeah, as long as you keep bringing us up, we're so, loving it. So. Well, you know what? I, I really do well with you, though, man. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not shy about telling you know great how grateful I am to people that helped me out. Um, and I told you that day I, I, I we went out to lunch. Um, that thank you very much for what you've done. I could have went with other people. You were a little bit, a little bit more pricier, but I had a really great feeling about you, and you hit the nail on the head. Your documents were beautiful. The things you did for me and the way you explained things to me and the patent process, which I had never gone through before, was truthfully, um, it was, it was, it was, it was an education, Richard. And I can't wait to come up with another idea so I can run it by you. And hopefully I'll get a better rate. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I mean, especially if, if we all come up with something. A piece of your nice company. I mean, I'm not yeah. be able to work a deal that way. No, so, so my goal, my goal is actually, um, you know, something I've always wanted to get into was car washes, right? Um, I want to start a franchise car. Oh, by the way, Rich, uh, Robert Raymond, I want to talk to you about something. I think you should start like a franchising program for your book and for what you're doing. Um, I, I know it'll work. There was a guy that Larry Schiffman, the guy named Larry Schiffman from 20 years ago I met. He used to do something like that. I would love to talk to you and give you some kind of idea on that concept. When you were talking about it, I was like, this guy could be selling training systems throughout the United States of America at 1500 bucks a clip. And we could probably bring in maybe 10,000 students within two or three years. I think that's a lot of money. And I think you should start looking at something like that if you're already not. I mean, I, I think you're that good. OK, I also noticed how you have the books in the background. Very cool. Very good. Right. You're the man. I cannot wait to hear about Jason, though. Richard, I'm telling you, I Googled him on I, I Googled him. I, I checked out his website and, and everybody is so, so, so inspirational. And they're just so great at what they do. But this guy, he's got a really cool story. And, and I, I can't wait for you to get to him because I want to hear it right for, right out of his mouth. Well, with that, thank you very much, Michael. We're going to have to have you back on the show, obviously. <laughs> everybody, of course. Um so, Michael, before we end the segment, what is the best website for people to find you? Um, it's real simple. Um, it's academyservicegroup.com. So it's academy, A-C-A-D-M-Y, D-E-M-Y, S-G.com. Or even better than that, micros.com. If you just go to micros.com, it'll link you up to my companies. And you'll see some of the companies that I own um, on these maintenance, these maintenance companies for the, you know, that take care of the United States. Perfect. And, uh, Thank, Thank you, you so much. But cool. you are listening <laughs> you are listening to Passage to Profit the Inventor Show with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, our special guest, Robert Raymond Riopel. And we will be right back after this message. Well, welcome back, listeners. You are listening to Passage to Profit the Inventor Show on WOR 710, the voice of New York. Wow, have we had a show and we're not done yet. If you've missed any of it, our podcast comes out tomorrow. You can see all these good looking people on our YouTube channel and on our social media. And uh, yes, I see people (laughs) grooming themselves as I say. But I am so excited about our next presenter, Jason Ellinger with Beard and Bowler. And you have to look him up because he lives his brand. And I'm going to let you tell him all, or I'm going to let him tell you all about what he does. So welcome, Jason. Thank you for having me, guys. Uh, First of all, I'm now a fan of the show. Uh, Mike, I'm going to take you with me uh, on my next show. I need you on my podcast. I don't even have a podcast. I'm just going to get you on there. (laughs) You are awesome. I love you. I love everybody's segment here. And uh, it's such a great group of people that we have um, on this show. But uh, my name's Jason Ellinger. I'm a commercial filmmaker. I've been doing it since 2007. Uh, we specialize or focus on nonprofits stories um, and working with foundations to bring those stories to life, uh, at least the foundations that, that want to invest in their nonprofits instead of giving them the same dollar amount year after year. Um, that's, that's who our uh, main target is. And uh, it's, it's a privilege to hear some of the stories that we hear, all of the stories that we hear, whether it's nonprofit or in the few commercial clients that we work with. Um, but yeah, I, what else would you, what else would you want to know? I don't know if you want to get into my story or, or, um, yeah. Why don't you tell us how you got into helping nonprofits? Um, so I started out working for the news. I worked for the news for about a half decade. 
Um, before that, I was doing video since 07. Then I needed to get mit not needed. I wanted to get married um, and uh, I needed a bit more stable income. And um, I took a day job with the news thinking that this will be temporary. I can work this and work my my business as well, because it was the 4 a.m. shift. So I was like 4 a.m. to noon in between stories. I'm in my laptop, you know, and, and after after work, I'm working on the business. Um, but I ended up being full time with the news and it was hard news station. So I was covering uh, I was a photo journalist. So I was covering a lot of the bad stories in the bad towns uh, in New Jersey, Patterson, Newark, Trenton, um, fire, shooting, stabbings, murders every every day, every week. Um, and I think the pinnacle of it uh, for me was when my assignment editor called me up and said, I'm going to need you to go to an 11 year old's funeral and, and cover that. And it's always nerve wracking if you go there, especially if you're the only one there showing up at a funeral with a camera and then you have to interview people like and my reporter is just tweeting on her phone, as is her job. And she kind of nudges me and says, make sure you get the mother, um, like just get the mother. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, go interview the mom. And um, as I'm sitting there, like interviewing this, this mom who just lost her kid, I'm still kind of, kind of, you know, justifying it to myself. Like maybe somebody will see this, maybe somebody will learn, maybe somebody will adjust their, their behavior because of it. And um, it just, it didn't happen. I was there the back to the next month, week, day, um, same type of story, same type of crime. And I realized that maybe what I was putting out into the world was was actually causing more more harm than good. Um, so I decided to start meeting with someone I called my guru. And uh, I said to him, I want to do something that's going to make a big, bigger impact than what I'm doing now for the positive. And he said, well, what do you want to do? I'm like, it's still video. It's still tor storytelling. Like Helen said, that's that there's so much power in that. And, and it has the power to change people's minds, has power to change culture, has the power to change the world. I still believe that's the route, especially that we're in this digital age now of social media and, and connected TV and everything like that. It's so easy to get a story out there and have it be heard. Um, and he said, OK, um, so where, where, where do we start? And I had heard about this guy named Willie who had a small community farm, uh, urban, urban farm make, uh, farmer. And uh, he was across from two, two burned down buildings in, in one of the worst sections of Patterson. And he cultivated this abandoned lot and just turned it, he had to bring in his own dirt. He turned it into uh, a community garden. He teaches kids that are from the area that may only have one parent or no parent just to come in and how to work the dirt and the earth. And this is how you can do something to produce something. Holds a farmer's market every other weekend and, and, and says, if you can't afford to donate, just take it back. I'm like, that's the story that I wanna tell. Like that's the story that's gonna inspire the soccer mom from the next town over to do the same thing in her community or in another community that needs it badly. That's the story that I wanna tell. And then he kind of got choked up, looked at me and said, I wanna tell that story too. The problem is there's no money in, in that story. Um, how do you make a living at that story? Um, but the important part, as we sat there with bourbon and cigars on his porch, uh, was that we established the why, uh, what, what that why was, and then had to reverse engineer it from there and, and figure out how to turn it into something profitable that we could make a, a living at. Um, and I asked him to be my business partner. And uh, that's kind of how Beard and Bowler got its start in 2016. Um, with the focus on positive stories that are going to make a difference uh, in the world. That's awesome. Kenya, do you have a question? For I do. I, I'm kind of speechless because I feel like, you know, we get so caught up in this superficial business of meeting entertainment sometimes, and we miss a lot of these stories. So I'm so happy to just hear that someone is really taking that initiative and, and building a platform I was reading in your bio um, that one of your goals is to change selfish culture and bring back chivalry and honor. And I wanted you to explain that a little bit more because that's a big statement. <clears throat> yes, that was a big statement. And that's what we started. <laughs> we started the business with that. And um, we even had something called the secret order where we had like a number of face, uh, Facebook group members just join and, and uh, going around and doing good. And uh, we realized that maybe should be the last step in, in the business. Uh, 
once we start making a profit and settling and creating a business, then starting to do good. Um, but we found a way to do it both ways, kind of in tandem. Um, when you hear a positive story that really resonates with you, um, that's the way to affect change. And we do that with nonprofits in particular uh, because we found the best stories in nonprofits. And um, our biggest our biggest job is basically telling a nonprofit like, no, we don't need to hear from your entire board. Nobody cares. Nobody wants stats. Nobody wants this. They want a story. Same thing with businesses when we works the same way. Nobody cares about stats, history, figures. They want a story. Show me a character who looks like me, who's gone through something similar to me, and then tell me how you help them get out of that problem. But spend some time in the problem. Don't add a resolution until the very end. So in finding uh, stories within nonprofits and then really finding a formula, we use the same like seven part formula that major Hollywood movies do to tell a story. Every, every movie that keeps you engaged to the end. Uh, in finding those stories and then telling them properly, that's where we found the biggest catalyst for change. That's when we see the tears in the, in the eyes of people in 300 and 500 and 1,000 people galas uh, when they were having them and now that they're coming back. That's when we saw change happen. Like I see myself in this person. I don't have to be this person. Um, I can help people like this. Um, there'll be other levels to that to come, but for right now, it's within the nonprofit realm. That is brilliant and amazing. And I mean, really to figure out how to make that work and to bring a positive note to society. I mean, thank you so much. And unfortunately, we're out of time for this segment. I'd love to hear more of these stories. So how do we find you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Jason Ellinger is where I'm most active or our website, beardandbowler.com is where we have uh, most of our work within the, the nonprofit sector. So definitely look up Jason and see what he's doing. It's amazing. So uh, listeners, you are listening to Passage to Profit, the Inventor Show on WOR 710 with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And we will be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to Passage to Profit. It has been an outstanding show, hasn't it? It has, and it'll be great on our YouTube channel and podcast, too, Passage to Profit Show. So just to remind you of who was on the show or tell you if you missed it, our guest was R Robert Raymond Riopel. He's an author, trainer, app designer. And he's going to show you how to get a clue. He's going to show you how to be successful and get a clue. And he's, yes, he's got some interesting techniques that you may not have heard of before. So if you want to find him, you can go to his website, successleftaclue.com. So he helps you pick out those clues and figure out what they are. <laughs> and then uh, Carrie Barrett from Carrie Barrett Consulting interviewed Helen Myers from three dots PR.com. And she's a great consultant. I can say from personal experience that she knows her stuff. Yes, Carrie's helping Richard improve his delivery on Passage <laughs> to Profit. <laughs> and um, and uh, Helen is really up on things and has a lot of good advice for people that are looking for PR and she can help you sort out the difference between PR and other types of I really liked her se part, her segment on ROI on PR, because yeah. I don't think that's fully appreciated by a lot of people in the business community. Right. So. And her website is the number three, then D-O-T-S-P-R.com. So it's three dots PR.com. And then we had Mike Rose and. Yes. A Rose by any other name other than Mike, would not be a Michael. Mike, Michael, whatever you want to call me. <laughs> <laughs> and his website is micros.com. And he's just got a lot of things going on. He's very creative and very passionate. Creative. Yes. And um, yeah, so go check out micros.com. And he's a fun guy to talk to. All these people were fun to talk to. Um, I'm a fun guy, like a mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure one. what that means, but it like sounds like, like, mold. Fun guy, like a mushroom. Oh, Get it? <laughs> That's like a dad joke. You know? oh, yeah. And then last, but certainly not least, 
we had Jason Ellinger with Beard and Bowler and his website is beardandbowler.com or you can find Jason on LinkedIn. Jason is just doing amazing things with video in the nonprofit space and and it, it's a pat you can tell it's a passion project of his and it comes from the heart and it shows in his work it's amazing so look time, him up time for some good news for for a change <laughs> yeah. you know and not just the old ugly oh, stuff and, that sometimes we get and we also had power move with kenya gibson and we have to say a couple of things about kenya so it's k e n y a g i p s o n at iheartmedia.com and Kenya is one of the most creative people I've ever met in my life. And she has such great ideas for marketing that are so they're out of the box, but not so far out that people don't get it. Like their, their next generation are just super creative and Absolutely. she can also help you get on the radio or do digital advertising, whatever you need. So email her at Kenya Gibson, at iheartmedia.com. That's, that's great. Yeah. And so we're signing off. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We, we love our audience and keep the let cards and letters coming in. <laughs> and um, we'll be back next week with another fantastic episode of Passage to Profit yeah, at, at the sign, same time. Uh, before we go, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our producer, Noah Fleischman, our program coordinator, Alicia Morrissey, and our video editors, Chatter Boss. So you're listening to Passage to Profit on iHeartRadio, WOR 710, the voice of New York. Ta-da, we're done. <laughs>